Hello, welcome to Zocalo Live on Twitter. I'm Jen Murchia and I'm in beautiful College Station, Texas. And I'm joined by William Sturkey, who is a professor of history at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And he is this year's Zocalo Book Award winner for his awesome book on Hattiesburg, Mississippi, which he's gonna to talk to us about today. And I have a book coming out um, in just a few weeks called Demagogue for President, The Rhetorical Genius of Donald Trump. And so he and I are gonna to chat today about both of our books. You can find links to the books in the Zocalo Twitter feed, and uh, you can join us on Periscope and, and give comments. Hey, William. Hey, how are you? I'm in Chapel Hill, just for reference. <laughs> Did I not say, I meant Chapel Hill. <laughs> Tar Heels, right? <laughs> Tar Heels, indeed. Both big sports schools. <laughs> Go Aggies. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, um, let's get things started with, with a question from me to you. And I'm really interested in drawing on years of your research, but using recent events to do that, even some recent events um, from earlier today. I don't know how much news you've been watching, but um, so I'm interested in talking about some of the communication related to recent events in the news, especially with some of the protests that have been happening across the country, and then also with this um, issue over Confederate memory be it on military bases or in, you know, on college campuses like ours or, or in southern cities like ours. And I wonder if you could maybe just start off by talking about um, the way that Trump, the, the president, communicates in terms of who he's trying to talk to, sort of what his audience is with, with you know, even broad terms like make America great again and law and order. And, you know, what are the racial dimensions of the way that he communicates using those, you know, very charged phrases, where do they come from? And then, you know, it strikes me that every now and again, he talks about, you know, how great of a president he's been for African-Americans. So like the example the other day was that he said he's been the best president, for, or he's done more for African-Americans than any president, except for Abraham Lincoln, who he said, you know, there were some questions, right? But in any event, he wanted to put Lincoln aside, but besides Lincoln, it had been him. And so I just wonder if you might also compare the way that he's talking to white voters compared to this message to black voters when it doesn't seem like there's as much sort of cultural substance, if you will. So I know, I, I know that's a really big question, but I wonder if we could just start to unpack that. Yeah, that's a huge question. And I'm probably not gonna answer all the parts of it because <laughs> um, there's lots of good stuff to say. Um, but let's see. Uh, so the Lincoln thing, I really want to mention, and I'll do that last because that was really interesting to me. Um, so in my book, I write about how Trump uses um, six rhetorical strategies, three uh, bring him, ingratiate him with his supporters, and three move him and his supporters away from everyone else. Um, that he takes advantage of distrust and polarization and frustration um, in making these appeals to both his supporters and his opponents. Um, and quite a few of them actually have to do with race, um, which is really interesting. Um, so one of the, the ones that um, he uses to bring himself closer to his followers is American exceptionalism. And so that would be um, definitely a part of, you know, the slogan, make America great again, um, you know, or keep America great, which maybe is the current slogan, but maybe not. I think he might have put that one away for a while. Um, and what he argues, and, and it's really even just a part of his hero story and the story he tells about himself, right? So he says, I was born on Flag Day. And, you know, because of that, I represent the greatest, um, you know, that there is of America. And instead of thinking of American exceptionalism, uh, as you and I might do, um, he thinks of it, you know, which is sort of like America's obligations um, to the world or, you know, just America's uniqueness. Um, he really thinks of it as American winning. Um, and so he, he 
says that he's the winner, you know, he's sort of American winning personified. Um, I, I write that he's the apotheosis of American winning in Trump's version of Trump's story. Um, and so he really links that to, um, to questions of uh, authority and authoritarianism, of um, restoring or defending the rights of Trump's people, um, which is very much linked to race. And one of the ways that he pushes people away um, is through reification, which is treating people as objects. And so if you examine the way that Trump uses rhetoric, um, uses the rhetorical appeal of reification, um, it's, it's almost always about race and it's about, um, you know, taking people who Trump doesn't like and treating them as objects or as animals. Um, historically, that's, you know, of course, been a part of war rhetoric. It's been a part of genocidal rhetoric in particular, um, you know, really dehumanizing people, uh, which, which argues that, um, you know, they have less value than other people. Um, so it's really insidious. So there's that. And then I have a chapter in my book about how Trump uses paralipses, which is the rhetorical figure, you know, that you can say colloquially is, I'm not saying, I'm just saying. Right. Um, and he uses that in particular when he talks about race. Um, so in my book, I, I explained how, you know, Trump will retweet um, objectionable content, um, you know, like from white nationalists or more recently from Q, conspiracy theorists. Um, and then he's, he won't take responsibility for it. And he just says, oh, you know, what do I know? You, you retweet someone and all of a sudden they turn out to be white supremacists. <laughs> um, you know, and he says, you know, I didn't tweet it. I just retweeted it. So, you know, I, I wasn't saying it. I was just saying it. Um, and so he uses that because it provides him with the out of plausible deniability. And so, you know, reporters will say, you know, are you racist? And he'll say, no, no, I'm the least racist person, you know, you've ever met. Um, and so he'll get headlines that say Trump says he's not a racist. Um, but then he'll amplify racist content or, um, you know, make statements that are clearly a part of the racist um, rhetoric and rhetorical tradition in America. So, um, you know, he has it both ways. And that's one of the ways that I think that he's really um, tricky. Now, before um, I stop talking here, I just want to go back to that Lincoln thing, because it's just so interesting to me. Um, you know, he wants us to think that he's the greatest president that's ever existed. And um, of course, when historians and political scientists and average Americans rank the presidents, they usually rank Lincoln as the top. So it's usually Lincoln, George Washington, and FDR. And um, so, <laughs> you know, Lincoln is at the heart of America's, um, you know, sort of political understanding of what a great president is or could be. And so Trump wants that. <laughs> and so I really heard that moment where he said, you know, maybe it's not so great what Lincoln did. Um, I really saw that as like him trying to challenge Lincoln for the top spot, right? <laughs> it's like, I've done more than anybody, you know, including Lincoln, um, you know, as preposterous as that sounds. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll just I'll just state a fact in terms of African Americans in this country. The since Lincoln, at least, the time when the black poverty rate dropped the fastest, and the time when African Americans gained the most rights was unquestionably under Lyndon B. Johnson. And it's not even remotely close if you look at metrics, be it you know high school graduation, college graduation, income, poverty rate, housing. Every single metric includes in, improved more dramatically under Lyndon B. Johnson than any president in, since Abraham Lincoln. Maybe he's the only exception, but of course Johnson's a Democrat. We live in an era of hyperpartisanship, so I think it's um, you know it might not be all that within his, his his rhetoric to acknowledge that a Democrat also might have been a good president for African Americans at least. Yeah, it's so interesting. And I mean, in all of that reminds me of your research on monuments, 
um, and about how, you know, we remember, whether it's remembering, you know, the LBJ administration um, and, you know, what stands out to people about the 60s, or whether it's, you know, remembering the Confederacy and obviously the current political crisis around these monuments. Um, can you talk to us about that? Because I would love to hear, you know, just more about how we remember these, um, you know, contested political events what it means. Yeah, to sure. You know, I think a lot of times when people, when everyday people are thinking about history, we really take for granted the difference between history and the past. So the past is everything that's happened before now. History is the way that we interpret the past. So if, if I drop my pen, for example, that happened in the past. Now you might suggest that I drop my pen for one reason or that it meant something, when in reality I might say, well, it meant something else. It just depends on the perspective that we have. And so what we're dealing with across the country are these relics of people who were very interested in promoting a white supremacist vision of the past. And let me just say this clearly. The reason that historians think that so many of these Confederate monuments and bases and counties and cities represent a white supremacist version of the past is because that is exactly what the white supremacists who erected them said in the moment when they're erecting them. So groups like the United Daughters of the Confederacy, not only did they erect Confederate monuments, they also published a book about the Ku Klux Klan, thanking the Ku Klux Klan for protecting, in their own words, white supremacy. And so, you know, that's really been whitewashed, you know, 100 years later. But I think now people are really going back and they're looking at some of the individuals who put up the monuments, right, who who changed county names, who wanted to make sure that schools and textbooks contained all, contained all this Confederate hagiography, okay? And when you start to look at some of the other things that these individual actors did, some of those messages become even more egregious. So I think the thing that we forget is that these monuments weren't just dropped there in 1865 by the ghosts of the Confederates. They were put there you know, 40, 50 years later by people who were activists. And the reason that we have so many monuments, the reason we have so many towns and schools named after Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis is because those people were activists, right? They weren't just passive mourners trying to say, oh, lo and behold, you know, this awful war happened. They were saying, no, we are going to reshape public interpretation of this past. And it's pretty striking how effective they were. Right? We still have public figures today making the argument that the Civil War wasn't about slavery. Well, down there in Texas, you know, I've read the or Texas explaining why they were seceding from the Union. And they don't mention states' rights. They mentioned slavery 20 plus times. They never mentioned, you know, states' rights in the document. And um, they would have been very upset in 1861 if you would have said slavery has nothing to do with why you're seceding. They would have said, no, of course, it's the whole reason. It's the reason we love Mexico, you know? And so they were very, very effective. And I think one of the things that's happening now is, you know, a lot of um, people accuse modern thinkers of applying, you know, old principles, our, our new principles to old debates, but really we've never had as much of a contested intellectual landscape as we have now, because even going back just 40, 50 years, People like me weren't even allowed to work in institutions like the ones where you and I currently are employed, right? When my father was born, not one single African-American had ever been a professor where I currently work. And so in the creation of knowledge, you know, who got to publish books, who got to even go into archives? They didn't let black people into all the archives. When W.E.B. Du Bois was, was researching black reconstruction, he couldn't just go in the library and look at the documents himself. You know, so the production of knowledge was segregated. Our public spaces were controlled by people who were activists. They were promoting oftentimes a very specific agenda. And so, you know, it's it's a bit frustrating sometimes to hear these calls that, you know, oh, we're all biased today and thinking that people acting 100 years ago had no biases at all. When, in fact, the research, you know, the trail that they left behind demonstrates very clear bias. Yeah, it's interesting how that that charge of bias can be so um, politicized itself, 
right? Like it only seems like bias if it's against what you think is normal <laughs> and you can't recognize that normal is itself biased. <laughs> right, exactly. So I wanna, um, I wanna bounce back to you with the cultural appeal here to a certain set of voters. And you know, I study race, so I'm interested in bringing race back into it. But it strikes me that, you know, even in a moment when, when the president does say, you know, things like, what the hell do you have to lose? I'm the greatest president for African Americans since Abraham Lincoln, or he touts, you know, the unemployment figures. When it comes to culture, right, when it comes to, you know, law and order, or when it comes to defending army bases named for Confederates, it always seems to teeter to the white voters. You know, there's no sort of cultural um, acknowledgement to African American voters. And so I wanted to do that, to ask you to comment on that. And specifically, I want to draw a tie in here. You know, there are so many white Southern voters, I think, who their greatest hero might be Robert E. Lee or Jefferson Davis. But when it comes to black voters, their greatest hero is Barack Obama, so often, at least their greatest political hero. And so what does it mean that, you know, on one hand, we say we must defend the Confederacy and these Confederate figures, but then on the other hand, there's this incredible record, right, of attacking Barack Obama in these ways that, you know, are so racialized at times. I wonder if you might speak to that. Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly Trump wants to... Um, in those moments where he's challenged about um, about you know his record, uh, what he's done for the African American community, whatever, um, you know he does the same sort of marketing and branding that he does on a wide number of su subjects, right? Which is to say, Trump's the greatest, <laughs> you know, without any kind of, um, <laughs> without any kind of evidence or, or data or, you know, even anything that makes any sense to back it up. You know, he has what I, um, what I think of as a will to, to market, um, right? Like the Ubermensch had a will to power. Um, Trump <laughs> may also have a will to power, but <laughs> definitely has a will to market. He can't stop. He can't help himself. And so, yeah, you know, he'll, he'll try to market himself as, you know, the greatest uh, president for the African-American community, despite any evidence to support that during um, the 2016 election. And certainly since when he talks about um, what he will do and what he has done, it's always um, tied to the economy, right? So he would say, you know, I'm going to be the greatest jobs president that God ever created, and that's going to help the African American community, right? And, you know, so then people would say, well, you know, but why would they vote for you? Well, because I'm going to be the greatest jobs president. So it was always, you know, very much linked to, I'm going to bring America back and, you know, we're going to win. And when we win, you know, everyone will win. And so that's why they should vote for me. Um, he doesn't specifically, like you say, he doesn't specifically do things that um, would support anybody's logical claim to um, caring about the African American community or you know its issues. Um, in fact, he downplays them quite a bit. And you know, I really love your um, your your observation about how he consistently attacked Obama. And so you know, in lots of ways, it would seem like anything Trump would say would ring false. Um, I had a really interesting conversation yesterday with a reporter who was writing a story about. Um, right-wing conservative and Trump um, and their use of Antifa um, to talk about the current issues of um, systemic racism. racism. Um, and so, you know, the reporter's story was really about um, why is it that the conservative um, community is spending so much time talking about Antifa instead of talking about the legitimate concerns of systemic racism. Um, and, and I really liked that question because I think it's, you know, sort of related to what you're talking about here. Um, you know, it's a red herring. It's a distraction technique. Um, don't look over here at the central issue. Look over there. <laughs> Follow the trail. Um, and, you know, it does a lot of work for, for Trump and other conservatives where it says, you know, 
there's this scary, uh, you know, white vanguard that's causing all this trouble and trying to overthrow the government. They are militant. Um, you know, then there are these um, protesters who, you know, are being led or misled. Maybe, um, you know, they necessarily aren't um, asking for systemic change. It's these other anarchists that are, you know, causing trouble. And so really, you know, it distracts away from the central issue, which is systemic racism um, in all of the ways that that manifests itself in culture and society. You don't talk about that. Um, and you also don't talk about the fact that the African-American community wants serious reform, not just managerial reform, right? Wants radical solutions. Um, and instead you just sort of push all of that off on these people that you are imagining, you know, are creating all of these, um, you know, distractions or, or, I don't know, anarchy or whatever they are. Um, yeah. What do you think about that? Well, I want to follow up, actually. Sorry, I'm going to flip it back. But what exactly is Antifa to conservative thinkers right now? I mean, what is, I mean, you're right, it takes up so much space. I mean, what is, who are they exactly? And what is the threat? Yeah, I'm in a way, I think maybe they're a condensation symbol, which is something um, that political communication scholars write about, which means that um, it's like an object or an idea that you can put a lot of stuff into <laughs> um, and make it kind of work um, rhetorically. And so to me, it seems like Antifa is, um, you know, just the, the classic um, left wing devil term in a way, right? Like you can just call um, this group of people, you know, violent vanguard anarchists, left-wing socialists, like all of the labels that they use, um, you know, the, the way that the news is packaging and repackaging um, pictures, images, video, you know, taking things from protests in different cities, smushing it all together, making it seem as though, um, you know, violence is ongoing when it was two weeks ago or whatever. Um, you know, they really have been um, treating it as propaganda, um, right? So trying to mislead people to understand reality in a different way um, from what it should be. Yeah. You know, to, to, to respond to your question, I don't think I mean, I think that basically the Republican Party, the National Party abandoned black voters in 1964 when they nominated Barry Goldwater, a man who, as a senator, voted against the Civil Rights Act, or in other terms, he voted against ending Jim Crow, and no, no president, no Republican candidate for president has received, you know, over 80, over 15 percent of the black vote since then. And it seems to me that when when Donald Trump says things like touting the unemployment rate when it comes to African Americans, saying, what the hell do you have to lose? That he's never actually speaking to black voters. It seems as if they've just completely given up on those voters. And rather he's nodding to white voters who might otherwise question, do I really want to be voting in the same party as some of the open extremists, you know, like the guys that were, you know, saying hail Trump and the neo-Nazis and everybody who the media really did focus a lot on. And it almost seems to me as if, if, if you say, well, this is the best you know, unemployment black people I've ever seen in this country, then they're like, see, it's not all bad. It's not all just black and white. I'm not in that camp necessarily. Rather, I'm now standing with a guy who's actually helping provide jobs for African-Americans. Because I think that you know, to, if, if the Republican Party on the national level really wanted to attract black voters, I mean, I think that any, any discussion of how to attract black voters needs to get rid of the Democratic Party. The first thing they do is they say, well, blacks are stuck on the Democratic plantation. Well, you need to attract people, you know, as if we're all just brainwashed. But then I think you need to have, you need to stop trying to eliminate the black vote through voter suppression. But then also, I think he should apologize for the Obama stuff if he actually wanted to attract the black vote. But then, of course, that would repel many other people. Yeah, absolutely. And I really like your point about um, how it allows, um, it sort of helps white voters to resolve the cognitive dissonance that they might feel, you know, conflicting, like, I don't consider myself a racist. 
um, Trump seems to be, you know, a racist and I don't know, you know, how to handle that. Can I still vote for him? Um, and I really think that that's similar to what I saw him do in 2016. It really, you know, using paralipses, making, you know, really strong denials about um, his racism, while at the same time amplifying the voices of racists, um, you know, when uh, white nationalists attacked reporters in his name, he would say, well, what did, you know, the reporter do to deserve it? Um, when people would be out in the street, um, you know, sending homeless people to the hospital, beating them up bloody, um, you know, and saying Trump was right when they get to the police station, you know, and, and Trump would say, well, you know, they're, they're very patriotic Americans and they feel very strongly that they want our country back, you know, things like that. So, you know, people were shocked when he said there are good people on both sides after Charlottesville. But, um, you know, to me, that was really consistent with all of the messages that he had been sending throughout his campaign, which allowed him, you know, again, to, to say and not say, to amplify, you know, these voices, to, um, fail to condemn violence conducted under his name, um, you know, with racist intent. Uh, you know, all of that was really shady, but it allowed white voters to, to say, yeah, that's, you know, he's fine. He's not racist. He says he's not racist, um, right? He says he's going to do these things to help the Black community. So, um, you know, it's, it's a smart strategy if you want to do both of those things at the same time. Um, but, you know, it's, <laughs> it's why I call him a demagogue, right? Um, he's an unaccountable leader and he uses language in a very sophisticated way that prevents us from holding him accountable. Yeah. So what do you think about the law and order rhetoric? I don't know if you saw the news today, but even in signing um, this new executive order that among other things, I think it's designed to ban chokeholds. Um, he kept, you know, it's, he, he has this phrase, you saw it in 2016, but it just keeps rolling out. And sometimes it'll just come mid sentence. He'll get a little bit lost and then law and order. You know, he'll go on some other tangent and then law and order. And it's just, you know, what what kind of work is that exact phrase? You know, even, even today, he said even people that don't know that they want law and order really do want law and order. I mean, he just kept going for it. What is the yeah. work that, that phrase is doing right now for him? Yeah. So, um, you know, obviously that phrase has roots in, um, in the 1960s and putting down, um, you know, racial unrest and riots and stuff like that. Um, you know, again, I think it's part of his will to market, right? He just gets these phrases and branding in that he loves and he, he throws them in, sprinkles them around whenever he can. Um, but more than that, um, you know, I think it's really an appeal to authoritarian voters. So one of the things that I write about in my book is the way that, um, you know, not just Republican, because it's Republican and Democratic both, but um, that a, cons a considerable amount of um, voters in 2016 identified or tested as authoritarian on a authoritarianism scale. And those are people that perceive that the world is a scary place. Um, sometimes they locate those threats external to the nation, right? So build a wall, um, you either have a country or you don't, you know, those kinds of appeals that were very nationalistic were also designed to appeal to authoritarian voters. Um, but then also internally, they believe that they've been displaced from the social hierarchy, right? That the old rules, um, need to be enforced, um, you know, and if they would be enforced, then society would return to the way it ought to be, right? So you could definitely um, understand some voters, at least, understanding, um, you know, make America great again to be a kind of authoritarian appeal that says, you know, we're going to restore your place on the social hierarchy, you know, things won't be so scary anymore because you're going to be back on top. Um, and also, you know, when Trump gave his um, RNC acceptance speech, he said, I am your voice. Um, and I really see that as a kind of authoritarian appeal. Um, he's really saying, you know, there that either he's going to amplify the concerns of these authoritarian voters um, and represent them and, you know, 
make their issues um, salient. Um, you know, he sees them, he liked to say. Uh, but also, you know, it could be like, I am your voice, <laughs> right? So what I say is um, is what you will be thinking from now on. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and it sounds kind of absurd in some ways that some, you know, somebody would run for office saying those kinds of things. But, you know, from what I understand, those are the kinds of appeals that authoritarian voters in particular would respond to. And so those are the voters who are looking around, you know, probably they're the ones that these Antifa stories are really, you know, appalling, scary stories are really uh, resonant with, you know, they're, they're probably the ones that are, um, you know, still very committed, diehard Trump supporters who, who really are looking around right now and thinking that all of this is further destabilizing the social hierarchy and they're worried about their own particular future. Um, you know, so I think that that law and order appeal um, sounds pretty good to them. Yeah. You know, um, the best example of that, in, in my view, in terms of him saying, I will speak for you and essentially tell you, um, was the issue over Greenland. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, we get all these people, you've never heard them say the word Greenland in their life. And all of a sudden, they're arguing that we need to annex Greenland. And it was like, well, where is this really coming from? You know, I know he just said it, but like, you know, there was nothing before there. And the other observation that I think is interesting that I, I think historians are, um, we haven't really quite parsed this out fully yet. And I think we focus on Nixon because he won, obviously. But in 1968, we had three presidential candidates and of course, the second was Hubert Humphrey, Lyndon B. Johnson's vice president. And the third was George Wallace, the segregationist governor from Alabama. And all three of them used that term, law and order, repeatedly. Interesting. And nobody ever talks about Hubert Humphrey, whose party, you know, my lord, the Democratic Party in 1968, you just have to look at their own convention to see, you know, the, the chaos surrounding the internal politics of the Democratic Party, they were also calling for law and order from the top down. It's just interesting to me how that phrase has just been attributed, you know, to one political party and even potentially one person. And now, of course, it's being you know, co-opted and run back to as, as many times as possible by the current Republican candidate. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you go back to the ancient Greeks, um, right? Uh, Zeus wed Themis, right? Who was God's law. And they had three children, the Ore, and they're the principles of humanity. Um, one is good order, eunomia. And the other one is, um, is DK. And then the other one is Irene, right? So it's peace, order, and law that are supposed to be the principles of humanity. So, you know, on, you know, the phrase has been co-opted and, and turned into something um, specific um, in the context of Richard Nixon um, and, and maybe in the context also of Donald Trump. But you're right, like those words themselves are um, either benign, right, or beneficial. Um, we want good order. Like the search for good government is the search for how we can enact good order. Um, it's it's the principles of justice that you know need to be deployed right um, to make the order good and yeah. peace. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we have time maybe for one more question. I've been asking a lot, but if you if you want to, I'd be happy to. Um, well, you know, I was really inspired. Um, I got to read all of your stuff. Um, maybe not all of your stuff. I got to read a bunch of your stuff. And I was really inspired, um, in particular, about the personal story. And you touched on this a little bit um, at the beginning. But, you know, just the personal story that you have um, in this moment in, about the historical work that you do and how that work wouldn't have been possible 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and about the sort of new historians and the new history of the South. And, you know, I really think, you know, causal arguments are tricky, obviously, but um, I really think that if we didn't have that history, that new history, you know, 
you know, people might call it revisionist, but, you know, I think you probably would call it accurate, um, you know, that we wouldn't have these conversations that we're having now about systemic racism. So I just wondered if you could talk just a little bit, um, no pressure, um, <laughs> about like the value of history and the kind of history that you do and, you know, for this political moment. Yeah, I think, um, it, you know, I'll, I'll start off with an antidote from something I wrote a while back. And, you know, I, I was at this event for the Center for the Study of the American South at UNC. And a, a man during a conversation with me told me that his family had owned slaves and that those slaves had been very happily enslaved. And he had all these sort of antidotes about, you know, when Sherman came and the matriarch of the slave community told him to turn around because they were fine. And, you know, it's this, it's this, um, it's this story that, you know, generations and generations of white Southerners, especially those of great privilege, right, especially those whose names are all over our cities and things like that, um, that they've told themselves that, you know, everything that we have is so wonderful. It's, you know, it's, it's my family that built it. And yes, we had enslaved people and we had people that for a long time had disadvantages, but look at how they're doing now. You know, they are now welcomed on our college campuses. Now, I want to remind you sometimes, you know, this guy was saying that, you know, I just want to let you know, my people once owned people that look like you. But it's this sort of subtle reminder that, you know, our families built this, you know, they didn't necessarily do anything wrong because the enslaved people were so happy. And it's a sort of natural stream of progress that's led us up to this wonderful moment that we have today. And I think that's a certain Southern mindset, this paternalistic Southern mindset that goes, you know, way, way back, even before the um, creation of the United States of America. But, you know, the problem with that is that it really detaches from the reality of how African-Americans were prevented from participating in our democracy and from building wealth, I think, is the, the real key there, right? The reason that his family had so much wealth and influence, the reason that they still have mansions today, you know, in farmland today, the single most important reason for that is that they weren't black. It was not necessarily white privilege, it was the lack of disadvantage. And I think by going back and looking at Southern history, especially, and of course, American history, um, through the lens of non-white actors, it really is quite striking. You know, we have this, this narrative of America's the land of opportunity and progress, and much of that is absolutely true, and there are many examples of that. But the other, the other thing that's revealed is that it didn't always have to be this way. It didn't have to be that this man's family had so much wealth. And my family, which was from North Carolina also, but fled the state of North Carolina in the 1890s, my family did not stay here and was allowed to you know, accumulate wealth in the same way. And so the origins of our gaps in terms of, you know, any sort of achievement gap, you know, between white and black or Hispanic or whatever, um, any sort of wealth gap, it's not necessarily actually just because, you know, there's just one group of people that, you know, maybe started off a little bit better or that there's one group of people that are more capable. It's that generations and generations of people from certain groups were not allowed to have the same opportunities as others. And we're sort of going back and we're unpacking, you know, as opposed to talking about systems that were just unjust or, oh, they were men of their times or, oh, that's just the way it was. We're saying, no, this individual actor, right, worked to help to prevent black people from voting. And these were the consequences for black communities like Tulsa, Oklahoma, for example, which of course has been in the news. Tulsa, you know, Tulsa would have had a very wealthy black community even to this day had their Black Wall Street been allowed to survive, but it wasn't. And that's the reason, that violence is the reason, not just because that's the way it was or Black people were inferior. That violence is the reason that African-Americans in Tulsa have a wealth gap, or that's a large part of the reason that they have a wealth gap today. It's because of these histories that we've never really dealt with. And that's the other thing, <clears throat> you know, it's the other thing that is that is getting a bit old for people like me is that the burden of race is always carried by African Americans. So, you know, we live in a post-civil post -civil rights era and that's great and Jim Crow is gone. But then it's like all of this pain and suffering, thinking about what your descendants went through, you know, as one group of people celebrates 
their heritage and their identity. And there are these streets that are named for white people. And there are all these big monuments that are named for, you know, white people. African-Americans just don't have the same thing, despite the fact that we lived in this country also in enormous numbers. You know, there was a, a guy from South Carolina, I was reading some news story the other day about, he was talking about they need to, uh, it, it was the woman who was fired from the Charleston School District. She was talking about how African-Americans need to respect our history. I bet she has no clue that South Carolina was the most um, highly majority black state in the history of this country in 1890, it's like 63% of the state was black and there's not a single thing, right? Even that commemorates the existence of those people. And so we really need to even those things out. You know, we've got a hundred some monuments all over Charleston and virtually nothing deals with the actual people who, who live there. It's just glorifying one group of people over the other, right? It's saying, this is the basis of our civilization. Like this man was saying to me, this is the basis of our society. This is who deserves credit for building the America that we all now enjoy. And what that does is it fundamentally excludes millions and millions of people. And I think we need to set the record straight because I think one of the lessons that we can have here as we begin to reincorporate more people from our past into our nation's story is that we need to have a nation where everybody gets a chance. You know, for, you know, people love the, the movie Hidden Figures, for example. Those three women were incredible, but for every one of them, there were hundreds of thousands of others who never got a chance. And, but those people were also part of America. They're also part of the South, and they should be drawn back into our history. And we also need, if I can just say one final thing, I think we also need to seek some moral clarity as a nation, right? Um, I understand that times change and, you know, our understandings of morality can be very different than they were 100 years ago. But there are some elements of our humanity that are universal. And we need to say, you know, it's these people were wrong on this, right? It was wrong to enslave. It was wrong to lynch. It was wrong to rape. And I think that's going to help us gain a, a greater sense of moral clarity as we move forward in this country. And hopefully we can someday get beyond all of these incredible racial problems. Wow, thank you. Thank you for the history that you do, the work that you do. Um, and thank you for explaining all of this to everybody. I think it's really gonna make a difference. Um, I'm told that our time is up, so I'm gonna say goodbye. Um, and I just wanna say thank you to Zocalo for inviting us. Um, and it was really a pleasure to get to have a conversation with William. If you're interested in either of our books, again, there's links in the Twitter feed. You should be able to find them. Um, William's book in particular is just wonderful and I highly recommend it. So thank you and see you again soon on the next Zocalo Live on Twitter. All right, thank you.